That's your power. It is pure power. We have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be. And part of that is not just what I want to do in the world, but that's how I want to feel moment by moment. And how do I find real connection and real meaning in doing so? Welcome to another episode of Over the Wall. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, amazing person. In 2008, she did this TED Talk that is still, I think, the most watched TED Talk about she was basically observing one side of her brain shutting down and having this stroke. And then she wrote about that in a book called My Stroke of Insight. She also has a new book out called The Whole, Whole Brain Living. And we're just so fortunate to have Dr. Taylor here on the program. So welcome. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. I'm really excited about our time. You know, as, as I was talking before the program, it, it's kind of like, I'd like to break it between your book and all these wonderful things you talk about. And then also we've had some people on the show talk about things like the little voice in their head and everything. And I want to get to where- I love it. Talk about where does that- Let's chemistry talk go? about that. Talk about yeah. that First, I guess for people who have not seen your TED talk or not read your book, if, if they, they're in some cave somewhere, uh, maybe you talk about, you know, what happened uh, when you were 37 years old and that fateful day that got you here. Sure. Thank you. So um, I was a neuroanatomist, a brain scientist at Harvard in the department of psychiatry. And my area of specialty was how does our brain create our perception of reality? And I cared about this because I have a brother who is only 18 months older than I am, who was diagnosed with the brain disorder schizophrenia. And as a sister and a scientist, he's the closest thing to me that exists in the universe. So why is it I could connect my dreams to my reality, but my brother could not? So I was happy uh, studying the, the brain and doing research, teaching about the brain. And then one morning I woke up to a major hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of my brain. And over the course of four hours, I watched my own brain deteriorate through the eyes of a scientist who thinks in terms of how does my brain wire each of these circuits for me to be able to do each of these functions. So over the course of four hours, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. And it was, you know, through the eyes of a scientist, it was a fascinating experience of watching the breakdown. But the real lesson I got, Rob, was that I lost my left hemisphere hemisphere and what's going on in my right hemisphere when my left hemisphere is completely non-functional and no longer inhibiting that right hemisphere. So it took eight years for me to recover. And then I ended up writing uh, a memoir, My Stroke of Insight, and I gave the TED Talk. And uh, that was the first TED Talk to ever go viral. So my claim to fame is that Ted and I got famous together. Yeah, I remember you, I think you read it, you were the sixth <laughs> TED talk or something. There was only like, yeah. there was, and yours has, I looked 25 million views on them. So obviously people, it's not, a, it's the content. It's yeah. just so fascinating because I think people, we don't understand our brains. It seems yeah. like this thing that's so important in our body, but yet we don't have a really great understanding of it. But I think you try exactly. to do is try to break it down. What's happening? How is it? Great? So I kind of wanted to start with, we got this left side and the right side <laughs> and yes. these lobes. And you talk about that. Maybe you can explain the traditional way of looking at that. And then yeah. you've got a new way to look at that. Yes. So um, most of us have, been, have heard, oh, we only use 10% of our brain. And that's just not true. If there's a neuron in your brain and it's alive, you're using it. Um, so forget that we're only using 10%. The other thing that we've been taught is that the right hemisphere is our emotional brain and our left brain is our rational thinking brain. And that's not true either. We have evenly divided tissue, emotional tissue in each hemisphere. And we have evenly divided thinking tissue 
in each hemisphere. And the two hemispheres are completely different in the way they process that information. So the right hemisphere is a right here, right now processing machine. If, uh, if a tree you're sitting outside, if a tree limb threatened to fall on your head right now, you would respond to that in the present moment. That would be an alarm, alarm, alert, alert. I'm, am, I'm in danger. The left hemisphere is of the past and of the future. So all of our emotions about the past or all of our thinking about the past, like why did you pick to put, choose to put the shoes on that you have on right now? You know, you can remember why you made those decisions because your left hemisphere is online and functioning. So we have these two very different perspectives of how information is being filtered into ourselves. And then they're communicating with one another through some 300 million axonal fibers so that each hemisphere is inhibiting the other hemisphere or communicating about this is what we're thinking about and this is what you're doing. So uh, the left hemisphere might say, okay, we're gonna tell a lie. So the right brain, it says, okay, we're gonna tell a lie. Don't show it on our face. And then the right hemisphere makes its own decision as to whether or not it's going to show it on our face and we're going to try to get away with that lie or if we're going to be clearly lying. So, I mean, we, we have these very different parts of our brain, too emotional and too thinking. And so my new book, Whole Brain Living, is about those four modules of cells and how each of those modules of cells projects a character profile into the world that actually has a personality. And then we have the choice we have the power to choose moment by moment which of those characters we want to embody at any moment in time. Gotcha. So when you look at these four characters, let's dig into them a little further about, you know, what, what are they, you know, how do they work together, stuff like that, you know. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so we all have these conflicts going on inside of our brains and, um, and a, an emotional conflict might say, okay, well, let me start with this. Go to the left brain and the left brain has a past and it has a future and it has thinking and it has emotion. So the thinking rational brain is interacting with the external world. The, the thinking portion of our left hemisphere and there's actually a group of cells in there, Rob, that define the boundaries of where I begin and where I end. And it's a holographic image that is created inside of my own brain by those cells in the left hemisphere. And if I don't have those cells, then I don't recognize that my face is my face, but the atoms and molecules making up my glasses are not my face. So I have to know where I begin and where I end. So the left hemisphere does that. It gives me my individuality. As soon as it gives me my individuality, it gives me an ego center where now all the information coming in from the external world is going to be filtered through me, the individual. So then I have me and mine, and I'm looking at the external world, and I'm climbing a hierarchy. I'm accumulating more things. I want to be higher on the hierarchy than other people. Um, and and so, so that's what's kind of going on. It's the A-type personality. It's the busy, busy. It likes to organize and control people, places, and things. Um, it, it defines what is right and wrong, what is good and bad. It defines what is achievement, what matters. And, um, and we all know that part of our personality. And it's necessary to be a functional human being in the external world. And I encourage people to give that part of their character a name because it's an individual part of our brain. And we talk oh. about this. We've talked about this little voice in your head, this little voice. And we've actually... Uh, I've talked to it to almost everyone on the show. I asked them like, what is that little voice telling you? For me, it always told me it's a negative voice. It's a voice that's kind of like challenging me all the time to like, it tells me, oh, you're too young to do something or you're inexperienced to do something. And so we, I was trying to understand yeah. like, where does the voice come from? You know, yes. how is it manifested and stuff like that? You know what I'm saying? Yes. yes. So actually most of the voice that is negative well, the judgment comes in from that character one, the thinking part of that le left hemisphere. The emotional part of our left hemisphere is all of our pain from the past. 
So this is the voice that says, um, you know, I feel resentment because of something I did or I feel uh, or something you did, actually. <laughs> I feel resentment toward you or I feel guilty about something I did in the past or I feel shame about something I did in the past or I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Whatever it is, I'm not. And but what that group of cells did is the present moment is reality. Reality really is what is right here, right now. And so the right hemisphere is in the process of processing the right here, right now experience. But that tiny little group of cells that make up the emotional cells, the limbic system cells of the left hemisphere, that is a group of cells that was willing to step out of the blissful euphoria of the present moment because the present moment is what it is. And there's no worry about the past. There's no fear about the future. It's just right here, interesting and exciting. But that little group of cells in the left emotion was willing to step out of the present moment and compare what is happening right now to anything I've ever experienced in my past to decide whether or not what is right now is a threat. Am I in danger? So that little character too is the emotion of the left hemisphere. And that's the alarm, alarm, alert, alert. I've seen this before. I'm looking for a reason to push it away. It likes what is familiar and what looks like me, what sounds like me, what prays like me, what works like me, what is like me, and anything else that's not familiar is reason to push away. And so this is where our racism is going to come from. This is also where our craving tissue for any addiction that we might have is hooked into that little character too. So the little character too is usually the part of our brain that we all go to therapy in order to, can you fix this part of me or just, you know, cut it out? And it's like, but it, it's so important. And it's kind of our superhero because it is willing to step out of the present moment to make comparisons, to push away from anything that might look like a threat. And so the little voice in people's heads that are saying all those negative things are either in that character one or in that character two, because that's where language as it relates to me, the individual is based. But how does it, how does it get created? You know what I'm at saying? A neuro, at a neuroanatomical level. Now we're looking at the cells of the mammalian nervous system. Okay. And if you look at the cells, the structure of the reptilian brain, so, so the way evolution happens and new species get created is, let's say you had a worm and the worm just was a collection of cells and then all the kinks get worked out between the, the cells and the worm and systems get established. And then evolution says, okay, well, let's create something new. And it does it by adding new cells on top. And so then you're going to have creatures that have the level of like a spinal cord where we actually have vertebra and we have segmentation and different things are happening and, but they're different, but it takes eons of time for that, all the kinks to get worked out of that. And then the reptilian brain comes along and the reptilian brain then is going to have like a cerebellum, which is a uh, um, uh, kind of coordinated movement of limb buds. And you're going to have arms and legs now, and you're going to have um, uh, a, a medulla and a, and the tissue gets worked out there. So anyway, that's the brainstem. Now at the level of a reptile, the level of sophistication of the nervous system is pretty much on switch, off switch, right? I'm hungry, I eat, I'm no longer hungry. Um, I want a mate, I mate, I don't want a mate anymore. Uh, those kinds of things. So, um, so it's on off switches, but then new tissue gets added on top and that's going to be the emotional tissue on top of that brainstem tissue. And that is the difference between a mammal and a reptile. So in that emotional tissue on the left side and on the right side, we now have the tissue at a cellular level. Information is streaming in and in the right hemisphere, it stays in the right here right now so that we end up having a consciousness of the present moment. We can bring our mind to the present moment in an instant because we have cellular tissue that does that. But 
in the left hemisphere, that tissue at a cellular level, those cells were programmed to bring information in from the present moment, compare it to the past, project it into the future over a linearity of time. So it is that group of cells of that character too that actually at a cellular level shift our consciousness out of the present moment into an experience of having a past and having a future. And so that gives us then linearity of thinking whereby I know A happens before B happens, like I need to put my socks on before I put my shoes on. It is a biological phenomenon that is amazing. Wow. And then that's mamma mammalian. And then for human, we add new thinking tissue on top. And so the thinking tissue on the left is designed to refine and differentiate the function of the emotional characteristics of that character too, le of left emotion. And the character in the thinking of the right brain is designed to refine that thinking, that emotion of the right hemisphere. So the, the thinking tissue builds on top of the emotional tissue, meaning we are emotional creatures who think when many of us think of ourselves as feel, as thinking creatures who feel, we're really feeling creatures who think. So at a biological cellular level, that's what happened. Gotcha. Okay. So when we think about, you talk about the hero's journey, we have this hero's journey concept that, you know, if, there's, if, if you don't know the concept, watch Star Wars. Everyone says that's the perfect hero's journey. You know, person sets out on a quest they uh, they have this vision. It's kind of a windy road. They 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 get to some crossroad. We got to cross over that road, and then they become a hero and get to some good things. You talk about this in our brains. It's like yes. it's a part of our brains thinking, and yes. that's why Joseph Campbell, I guess, you know, saw that and said that's how people relate to story and storytelling, yes. right? So can you can you dig a little in that? Yeah, sure. So um, let me finish real quick. Uh, character number three. Oh, okay. is going right. to be the emotion of the present moment. And the emotion of the present moment is playful and joyful and interested and curious and all that judgment is in the left brain. So the right hemisphere doesn't deal with judgment. It is expansive and open and experiential. What does it feel like to be you? You know, what does it feel like to feel the wind on your face? What does it feel like, like to jump out of an airplane. What does it, it's, it's kind of an experiential adrenaline rush experience. Okay. And then character four is the thinking tissue in that right hemisphere. And the thinking tissue of the right hemisphere is just one of loving. It is loving and nurturing and supportive and blissful. And that's kind of when we meditate, that's where we want to go because it is our connection to something that is greater outside of that left brain that defines the boundaries of me, the individual. So in answer to your question then, when we think about a hero's journey, the first thing that happens is there's a calling, right? There's a calling. So I'm in my left hemisphere. I'm probably in my, my character one where I'm doing, being my alpha self out in the world, but there's something yearning. I have a yearning that is not being satisfied. Like I'm learning that money's not everything or the bigger house isn't everything. Not everything is feeling satisfied inside of me. There's something more. And so I feel this yearning. I feel this calling. And so then though, I'm an individual and I'm an individual and I know that I live or I die. And if I set down myself and my ego to expand into something else, oh my gosh, that feels like death. And so my little character too, my little emotional left brain is going to be going, oh no, we can't do that. That's not safe. That's not good. No, this is about me. We got to, we just got to try harder and do more and, and build more and be more and da, 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 da. And it's like frantic that, oh no, my ego, I can't put my ego down and go become more different. That's scary because that's what it's biologically programmed to do. Push away from anything that doesn't feel safe or feel familiar. And it has the ego. So setting myself down to go explore something 
it feels like I'm letting everybody down. It's wrong. It's bad. It's whatever. So those are the monsters. So the monsters that the hero has to compete are the, his own internal monsters. And but as you take the hero's journey, you know, call it a dragon or or call it a snake or or call it letting somebody down or call it whatever you're going to call it. Those are the monsters we have to battle in order to let our own ego settle down so we can step out of the consciousness of the left brain and step into the consciousness of the right brain. So the ultimate goal then is to lay my ego down. Now, I have big information here. Alarm, alarm, alert, alert. If you choose to set your ego down, it's never far away. It's always right there to pick up just like that. It's always available. You can always, you know, you can go running back anytime, but allow yourself to shift out of that consciousness of the small individual me into the open expansiveness of the, the higher me, the greater me, the different me, the present moment me. And so as the hero battles those battles, puts down the monsters, puts down that ego, and I step into the consciousness of the right hemisphere, this is where I'm curious. This is where I'm creative. This is where I'm innovative. This is where all possibilities are. And they're not just about me, the individual, they're about us as humanity. So we now become a part of the collective whole and the blissful euphoria of feeling connected to all that is, that is that consciousness of that right thinking tissue of the highest me there is, is that I am love, period. I am love. And I learn as the hero that my number one job, my number one job as a human being, as a member of humanity, our number one job is to love one another. And it's not about the me and the mine and I got to get mine because there's a small pie and I've got to take my piece of the pie and I need a bigger piece of the pie than you get because I want to be higher, blah, 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 blah. It's not about that. It's about how do I bring the best of me into community with other people in order to accelerate the health and the well-being of all of us. And um, and so that's the end. That is the, the achieving goal of the hero's journey. So the hero goes and, and finds bliss and finds love and finds beauty and finds that we are enough. Oh my gosh, what a concept. I am enough simply because I am. And it's the consciousness of that, that uh, right thinking tissue that says, I am so filled with gratitude for the fact that I have eyes that can see and I have ears that can hear and I have, so I can make sound and I can use words and I can communicate with another that is like me. And it doesn't matter what color your skin, what language you speak, where you live in the world. It doesn't matter what matters is that you and I are magnificent living creatures. This collection of some 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses. And oh my gosh, how do I join with you, Rob, and do something that is good for all of us. How do we bring our love into the world in a positive and healthy way? Now, at any time, my little character too is still right over there. You know, I can drop that down and go right back in a freak out at any moment. And I can step into that character one ego part of myself of alpha out in the world and know, you know, that, that right brain, it just, it's a waste of time. It has no value. It's no good. It's lazy. It's, it's, it's all this negative stuff. And it's like, no, we have all of this inside of ourselves. And, and that's, that's why I wrote this book is that we have the capacity to voluntarily get to know each of these parts of ourselves and actually bring them together in conversation because all the parts are fantastic and we need all of them. And but, you know, then it boils down, which is exactly what you, you where you began is what is the relationship like between the different parts of your brain? And what is that voice saying to you that is either constructive or destructive? And how do the other parts of you manage that part of your character? I, I talk about when I was 27 years old, I, my, my first company that I started at college went under and I ended up on this couch and I slept on this couch. I had no money. And I work with this guy, Dr. Frank Morio, and I, he's been on the podcast and he, and he made me understand something and I'll relate it to you. And maybe you can help us understand is that I had this perception of the world and it, a lot of it is my childhood and things, you know, like we all do. 
And what I learned was like the way he explained it was like, I had these glasses that were put on me that were actually the wrong lenses for me to see clearly. But yeah. because I grew up with them, the yeah. world seemed the blurry world seemed clear. Right. And he taught me to take like you first you gotta take the glasses off, and you're gonna put another set on to perceive yeah. the the world in the correct way for you to go ahead and fulfill your purpose and your dreams and have a happy life. This is tricky because you don't know you don't know if you got the, if you have the gla the blurry glasses on. Right. So when I think about what you write here and all these interconnected parts and how do I know my perception is serving me? How do I even know what my perception is? It's all about manifesting our perception of reality. You use these, right. this term. How does that, how do I know, how do I do that? How do I know if I'm perceiving things wrong or right? What, 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 what how do you get, to, you know, if you unpack that, how would you unpack that? I would say that, um, you know, purpose and meaning stem from our right hemisphere consciousness because it is that consciousness that connects us to the love, to the joy, to the gratitude, to the peacefulness of what I am as a living being. And when I know what my purpose is, when I know how to connect to the collective whole and say, how do I bring the skills that I've been given into the world? That's going to be the tool of the left brain. And uh, there's a wonderful book called The Master and His Emissary. And it's written by a psychiatrist in McGillcrest. And you'd probably enjoy that book. It, the first part about it is all about what do we know about science between these two hemispheres based on all kinds, 50, 60 years of, of animal study and work, working with human about the differences at a core level of these two hemispheres. When I, when I move into the expansive part and I say, here I am, I'm a part of everything that is, and I'm grateful for my life, and I want to find meaning in my action. I don't want to just do, 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 accumulate, accumulate, which is the value of the left brain, but I want the skill set of the left brain because the left brain has language. It has me, the individual. It is extremely functional, but my creative and innovative and open to possibility is in my right hemisphere. So when your physician said to you, take off the perspective glasses that you've been looking through the world with, you were looking through that left hemisphere. How do I climb the ladder? How do I do this? How do I do that? Make it happen, make it happen, use force, where the right hemisphere is saying, but these, this, isn't, this isn't the core of who I am. And so I'm creating wealth, or I'm creating this, or I'm creating that, or I'm failing at it. And frankly, I'm doing that because I don't, I don't have the energy of my purpose flowing through me opening up the possibilities. So the consciousness of the universe is where we find our meaning and our purpose. And then it's like, okay, now how do I use the rest of that magnificent left hemisphere to make it happen? And so this is whole brain living. He was asking you to be whole brain, put down the lens and perception of just the left brain and what it values and step into the consciousness of your right brain, which is open and shared as communal in relationship to all that is, other people, the uh, our relationship with the planet. And this is where our ingenious, innovative, really interesting parts of ourselves exist. And then take those and use that left brain as the emissary, not as the master. And if we are, if we let the left brain be the master, then that's what we do. We end up with left brain value structure. Everything's right and wrong and good and bad. And uh, we fit in a box and it's all about where am I on that hierarchy? And I'm going to be working, you know, 80 hours a week and I'm going to wear those black circles under my eyes like a badge of honor. And, um, but am I happy? No, I'm not fulfilled because I've shut down and judged negatively that part of my world where I actually find my deep inner peace. So we have to come from the peace and move into what do we want to create using that beautiful left brain? When I think about the world we're living in today, I call it the world's largest video game. 
which we're in this perceptive world of, you know, because we're not seeing each other as much and hopefully that'll change soon. But what do you think the effects are on the brain? And you actually, what I loved about your book, I think it's the last chapter is you took like generation from generation coming from World War II forward of how technology has affected their perception, their brain, their thinking. Maybe you, I, I'm curious because you're such an expert. What What is this doing to us? Is this harming us? Does this create, you talk about like also the, the characteristics of love, like your four characters, I mean, your four characters matching with someone else's characters. How does it connect? How does this all play out in this world we're living in digital? Just looking at the world, we are skewed. We have been skewed to the value structure of the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere says me, mine, I want more. And I want to be more than you. I want to be higher on the hierarchy than you. I need a bigger house than you. I need a bigger boat than you. I need prettier children than you. I need better education for my kids than you. I need more. I need more. I need more. So that is what uh, that's the materialistic world of that left brain. And the problem is that I can have all the money in the world or all the, you know, be high on that ladder, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any meaning inside of myself. I'm, I'm not fulfilled. And so I'm learning that more and more in that left brain structure is not fulfilling. And so what do we do? We turn to mind bending things like drugs and alcohol or uh, technology or sex or, or whatever it is that, that we start then craving and become addicted to. And it's that little character too, that really routinizes in the, well, I need more. I need more. I need more. Even though I feel worse, I feel worse. I feel worse. And then, and then the worse I feel, you know, it takes more and more because now I'm, 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 you know, you know, the, the gig. Yeah. So, so that's the left brain. That's, that's the mental health of our society. I mean, you know, just looking at the mental health of our society and how skewed we are to that value structure. And this is what what we're teaching our children. We're teaching our children, uh, you know, the idea is to get more and more and more instead of, of who are you as a human being and how are we open and connected as a human family and what is our relationship and responsibility to this planet. And when we come from that space, we come forward when the tide rises, all boats rise, right? Kind of, of philosophy. So, um, so that's where we are in the mental health of our society because we are skewed to the value structure of the left hemisphere. Now, I will also say then, then you look at, at our US politics, right? Oof, boy, is that a division. And as we look at the value structure of the, the Democrats versus the Republicans and, and you know, I mean, it, it has just turned into this very, very messy. We're not even talking uh, truth now. You know, at least <laughs> at least a decade ago, uh, people were punished for saying things that were not true. And now it's so rampant that that it, it you know, we're just running on this fast, fast train. And the thing about that left hemisphere is it is accelerated thinking. You hear it, it runs fast. It's on a train and it's running fast. And what about this? And what about that? And that little character too thrives in chaos because it is chaos. It is bringing information in and saying, give me a reason to say no, no, no. And how do I control my world? And, and the world is constantly a new moment. And so it wants more and more chaos. And then the rational thinking brain can come down and say, okay, we got you. We'll figure it out. We'll fix it. We'll make it okay. And the right hemisphere is just watching the whole thing going, wow, are we missing out on our lives? Are we missing out on real connection and real love and really what we can be as a human family? Um, and at the same time, it's up to us. It's up to us. That's a big, that's a tall order. <laughs> it's up to us. One brain at a time. One brain it's at up to time. us. Yeah, so it if, really um, is. If you were to, you know, leave us with one, first of all, you got to read the book. I, I think the book, I, I talk about this whole, the whole podcast based on this mental game. And it's so hard to understand the physics of the men, of the brain. And I think how you break it out and everything is just extraordinary. So I just think it's, it's, it's amazing. But if you were going to leave us with one thought yes. from, your, from your wonderful brain, what would the thought be? for, you know, entrepreneurs out there who are, you know, battling it out, who are 
getting tested every day, who are making mistakes and trying right. to cope from them, what, what would you say to them? I would say we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. But we can only do that if we know what our choices are. And our choices are these four beautiful characters inside of our head. And when we get to know each of those four characters, then we have the power to set down one character and step into the other character. And these characters inside of ourselves are constantly communicating with one another. But if we don't know who's talking to whom and who's valuing what, then we're just kind of running on that rampant trail that's running down the track. If you really want to know who you are, whole brain living, you got the whole brain. It's this magnificent thing inside of your head. And uh, truly getting to know who those characters are. That's your power. It is pure power. We have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be. And part of that is not just what I want to do in the world, but that's how I want to feel moment by moment. And how do I find real connection and real meaning in doing so? So it's really about this awareness, having an awareness of the four characters, which one is talking, shall we say, or right. acting, which one is is right. engaging you. Right. And uh, and then when you have an awareness of that, observe that, you'll know where you're coming from. And then you'll say, wait, 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 wait. The other ones right. need to be a part of this. So you're exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the whole, that's the idea of the all the characters working together that gives us this whole brain living concept. Exactly. That's right. I mean, then, then I become the master of my own mind. And if I'm the master of my own mind, what do I want? What do I really want? What do the different parts of me? So I might watch an advertisement, a part of me saying, yeah, I want that. But then if I really embody that and I say, okay, well, you know, what do I have to do in order to get that? What's it going to cost me? And is that what I really value? And do I want to go to work and make all that money so that I can buy that? Or would I really just have more time to be able to connect meaningfully in meaningful ways with the people I love? And how's that going to feel inside of my body? So if I'm true to myself and I'm not just, you know, chasing the rainbow, then it's like, wow, where is my meaning and who do I want to be? Well, Dr. Taylor, yeah. thank you very much for being on the show. Um, I could spend 10 hours with you. The book is like, it's, 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 it's amazing. Your life is amazing. Uh, I feel very blessed. You're very, <laughs> I mean, you're here, by the way, when you have I am. to you at 37 and you're still here. You know, exactly. we it, it, and tend to write about it and then to um, also talk about how really the brain works so it can serve us. So we can exactly. look at life for happiness and connectedness in the world. I just want to thank you for being on the show. You're just awesome. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate you. I appreciate the message you're communicating. And uh, it looks like you live in a lovely outdoor space. You're valuing <laughs> your right brain uh, value structure as well. So it's lovely. It's been lovely to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.